So with a head full of dreams and ambitions, I started my first job. About three years later, I got married, made lots of promises, and continued to work hard. A couple of years after that, we started a family. At age 25, I began taking a new look at my life. My weekly paycheck amounted to a grand total of $57. I was behind on my promises, behind on my bills, and discouraged, far from making the progress I should have made. I was willing to work hard. That was not the problem, but it was clear that it was going to take more than hard work, and I didn't want to wind up broke at age 60, needing assistance like so many people I saw around me, not in the richest country in the world. What, I wondered, could I do to change the direction of my life? I considered going back to school. One year of college doesn't look that good on an application. But with my family growing, going back to school seemed like a tough decision. I didn't have any money to start my own business. Money was one of my problems. I always had far too much month left over at the end of the money, if you know what I mean. I remember once losing $10 and being physically ill for two days over a $10 bill. Every day in a thousand different ways, we are trying to improve ourselves by learning how to do things. We spend a lifetime gathering knowledge in classrooms, in textbooks, in experiences. And if knowledge is power, if knowledge is the forerunner to success, why do we fall short of our objectives? Why, in spite of all of our knowledge and collected experiences, do we find ourselves aimlessly wandering? settling for a life of existence rather than a life of substance. There may be many answers to this question. Your answer may be different from that of everyone else you know. While there may be many answers to this question, the ultimate answer may be the absence of discipline in applying our knowledge. The key word is discipline, as in self-discipline. It doesn't really matter how smart you are if you don't use your knowledge. It doesn't really matter that you graduated magna cum laude if you're stuck in a low-paying job. It doesn't really matter that you attend every seminar that comes to town if you don't apply what you've learned. We spend our lives gathering, gathering knowledge, gathering skills, gathering experiences. But we must also apply the knowledge, skills, and experiences we gather in the realms of life and business. We must learn to use what we've learned. And once we've applied our knowledge, we must study the results of that process and refine our approach. Finally, by trying and observing and refining and trying again, our knowledge will inevitably produce worthy, admirable results. And with the joy and results of our efforts, we continue to fuel our ambition with the positive reinforcement of continued progress. Pretty soon, we'll find that we're swept into a spiral of achievement, a vertical rise to success. And the ecstasy of that total experience makes for a life triumphant over tragedy, dullness, and mediocrity. But for this whole process to work for us, we must first master the art of consistent self-discipline. It takes consistent self-discipline to master the arts of setting goals, time management, leadership, parenting, and relationships. If we don't make consistent self-discipline part of our daily lives, the results we seek will be sporadic and elusive. It takes a consistent effort to truly manage our valuable time. Without it, we'll be consistently frustrated. Our time will be eaten up by others whose demands are stronger than our own. It takes discipline to conquer the nagging voices in our minds, the fear of failure, the fear of success, the fear of poverty, the fear of a broken heart. It takes discipline to keep trying when that nagging voice within us brings up the possibility of failure. It takes discipline to admit our errors and recognize our limitations. 
The voice of the human ego speaks to all of us. Sometimes, that voice tells us to magnify our value or accomplishments beyond our actual results. It leads us to exaggerate, to not be totally honest. Some of my friends tried to be cheerful. They said, look, maybe some poor person who needed it found it. But that was not really helpful. At that time in my life, benevolence had not yet seized me. I was the person who needed to find ten dollars, not lose it. So that's where I was at that time in my life, behind on my dreams, constantly wondering what I could possibly do to change things for the better. Then good fortune came my way. Sometimes it's difficult to explain good fortune. Why do wonderful things happen to you when they do? I don't know. It's a mystery to me. My good fortune was meeting a very unique and successful man named Mr. Earl Schof. When I met him, I said to myself, I would give anything to be like him. I wonder what it would take. To make a very long story short, this very special gentleman took a liking to me. A few months after I met him, he hired me. I worked for him in several of his businesses until his unfortunate death five years later. The best thing he gave me during that time was not a job. The best thing he gave me was the benefit of his philosophy, the fundamentals of living successfully, how to be wealthy and how to be happy. Sure enough, his ideas worked for me. I will always be grateful for meeting someone who made such a difference in my life. If Mr. Schof were still alive, I would call him and thank him again for sharing the ideas and inspiration that made the difference for me. Now I have the chance to share these ideas with you. If you apply them in your own life, I know you will experience equally exciting results. And that's a promise. Chapter 1 A Magic Word Discipline We must unweave every strand of our cable of habits, slowly and methodically, until the cable that once held us in place becomes nothing more than scattered strands of wire. The human will in action, driven by inspiration, enticed by desire, tempered by reason, guided by intelligence, can bring you to that high and lofty place called the good life. Discipline attracts opportunity, which is always attracted to ambition and skill in action. Discipline taps the unlimited power of commitment. Discipline, those unique steps of intelligent thought and activity that put a lid on temper and a faucet on courtesy that develop the positive and control the negative, that encourage success and deter failure, that shape lifestyle and control frustration, that enhance health and curb sickness, that promote happiness and manage sadness. Discipline, the continuing process that brings all the good things. Remember, anyone can start the process. It's not, if I could, I would, Rather, it's, if I would, I could. If I will, I can. So, start the process. Begin a new habit, no matter how small it is. Size isn't important. Whether or not you start and whether or not you continue are all that matter. A Spiral of Achievement What's at the core of achieving the good life? It is not learning how to set goals. It is not learning how to better manage your time. It is not mastering the attributes of leadership. I don't know you personally. I'm not familiar with your dreams or problems. But I don't need to be. Because the ideas you are about to discover are fundamental to the art of winning. They are guaranteed to help you achieve your most inspiring dreams. Where did these fundamentals come from? I didn't make them up. 
I first discovered them when I was 25 years old, a time in my life when I needed some new ideas to help change my direction. I wasn't destitute at the time, but I certainly needed some help. I guess we could all use a little help at age 25. I had gotten off to a great start in life. I was raised in Idaho's farm country in a small community of about 5,000 souls. We were not far from the Snake River in the southwestern corner of the state, a great place to grow up. After graduating from high school, I attended one year of college. Then I decided I was smart enough, so I quit, which was but one of the many major mistakes I made in those early days. But I was ambitious and willing to work hard, and I figured that I wouldn't have any trouble getting a job, which turned out to be accurate. How do you get a miracle going? It's all a matter of discipline, and it begins with one simple step, doing what you can. Discipline enables you to capture your emotion and wisdom and translate them into action. Once you have seen and felt your ideal future, you will be ready and able to pay any price to get there. The bridge between thought and accomplishment. If there is one magic word that stands out above all the rest, it is discipline. Discipline is the bridge between thought and accomplishment, between inspiration and achievement, between necessity and productivity. Remember, all good things are located upstream from us. The passing of time takes us adrift, and drifting only brings us the negative, the disappointment and the failure. Failure is not a cataclysmic event. It is not generally the result of one major incident, but rather of a long list of accumulated little failings. If your goal requires that you write 10 letters today and you write only three, you are down seven letters. If you want to make five calls and only make one, you are down four calls. If your plan calls for saving $10 today and you save none, you are down $10. The danger is looking at an undisciplined day and concluding that no great harm has been done but add up these days to make a year, and then add up those years to make a lifetime, and it will become apparent how repeating today's small failures can easily turn your life into a major disaster. Success, on the other hand, is just the same process in reverse. If you plan to make 10 calls, and you end the day having made 15, you are up five calls. You can see what a massive difference this sort of thing could make in a year and what wealth and accomplishment await over a lifetime. Discipline is like a set of magic keys that can unlock all the doors of wealth, happiness, culture, high self-esteem, pride, joy, accomplishment, satisfaction, and success. The first key to discipline is awareness of the need for and value of discipline, especially the discipline to make the necessary changes. What will it take? What must I do and what must I become to get all I want from life? The second key is willingness. More than that, it is the eagerness to maintain your new discipline deliberately, wisely, and consistently. The third key to discipline is the commitment to master the circumstances of your daily life, to see and harness the opportunities to make something of the good as well as that which comes in the guise of misfortune. Discipline does many things, but most important of all is what it does for your mindset. It makes you feel better about yourself. Even the smallest discipline can have an incredible effect on your attitude. And the good feeling you get, that surging feeling of self-worth that comes from starting a new discipline, is almost as good as the feeling that comes from the accomplishment the discipline brings. A new discipline immediately alters your life direction. You don't change destinations immediately, that is yet to come, 
But you can change direction immediately, and direction is very important. Discipline cooperates with nature. Everything strives. It is a common life function. How tall will a tree grow? As tall as it can. Everything strives to become all it can possibly be. And that is what discipline is all about, striving to fulfill our natural potential to become all that we can be. Would I knew the answer, Kabai replied. No better than thou am I satisfied. My earnings from my lyre are quickly gone. Often must I plan and scheme that my family be not hungry. Also within my breast is a deep longing for a lyre large enough that it may truly sing the strains of music that do surge through my mind. With such an instrument could I make music finer than even the king has ever heard before. Such a lyre thou shouldst have. No man in all Babylon could make it sing more sweetly. Could make it sing so sweetly not only the king, but the gods themselves would be delighted. But how mayest thou secure it while we both of us are as poor as the king's slaves? Listen to the bell. Here they come. He pointed to the long column of half-naked, sweating water bearers plodding laboriously up the narrow street from the river. Five abreast they marched, each bent under a heavy goatskin of water. A fine figure of a man he who doth lead them, Kabai indicated the wearer of the bell who marched in front without a load. A prominent man in his own country, tis easy to see. There are many good figures in the line, Bansir agreed, as good men as we. Tall blonde men from the north, laughing black men from the south, little brown men from the nearer countries, all marching together from the river to the gardens, back and forth, day after day, year after year, naught of happiness to look forward to, beds of straw upon which to sleep, hard grain porridge to eat. Pity the poor brutes, Kabai. Pity them I do, yet thou dost make me see how little better off are we, free men, though we call ourselves. That is truth, Kabai. Unpleasant thought, though it may be. We do not wish to go on year after year living slavish lives, working, 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 getting nowhere. Might we not find out how others acquire gold and do as they do? Kabai inquired. Perhaps there is some secret we might learn if we but sought from those who knew, replied Bansir thoughtfully. This very day, suggested Kabai, I did pass our old friend Arkad riding in his golden chariot. This I will say, he did not look over my humble head as many in his station might consider his right. Instead, he did wave his hand that all onlookers might see him pay greetings and bestow his smile of friendship upon Kabai, the musician. He is claimed to be the richest man in all Babylon, Bansir mused. So rich, the king is said to seek his golden aid in affairs of the treasury. Kabai replied. So rich, Bansir interrupted. I fear if I should meet him in the darkness of the night, I should lay my hands upon his fat wallet. Chapter 1 The Man Who Desired Gold Bansir, the chariot builder of Babylon, was thoroughly discouraged. From his seat upon the low wall surrounding his property, he gazed sadly at his simple home and the open workshop in which stood a partially completed chariot. His wife frequently appeared at the open door. Her furtive glances in his direction reminded him that the meal bag was almost empty and he should be at work finishing the chariot, hammering and hewing polishing and painting, stretching taut the leather over the wheel rims, preparing it for delivery so he could collect from his wealthy customer. 
Nevertheless, his fat, muscular body sat stolidly upon the wall. His slow mind was struggling patiently with a problem for which he could find no answer. The hot tropical sun, so typical of this valley of the Euphrates, beat down upon him mercilessly. Beads of perspiration formed upon his brow and trickled down unnoticed to lose themselves in the hairy jungle on his chest. Beyond his home towered the high terraced walls surrounding the king's palace. Nearby, cleaving the blue heavens, was the painted tower of the Temple of Bell. In the shadow of such grandeur was his simple home and many others far less neat and well cared for. Babylon was like this, a mixture of grandeur and squalor, of dazzling wealth and direst poverty, crowded together without plan or system within the protecting walls of the city. Behind him, had he cared to turn and look, the noisy chariots of the rich jostled and crowded aside the sandaled tradesmen as well as the barefooted beggars. Even the rich were forced to turn into the gutters to clear the way for the long lines of slave water carriers on the king's business, each bearing a heavy goatskin of water to be poured upon the hanging gardens. Bansir was too engrossed in his own problem to hear or heed the confused hubbub of the busy city. It was the unexpected twanging of the strings from a familiar lyre that aroused him from his reverie. He turned and looked into the sensitive, smiling face of his best friend, Kabai, the musician. May the gods bless thee with great liberality, my good friend. Forward. Our prosperity as a nation depends upon the personal financial prosperity of each of us as individuals. This book deals with the personal successes of each of us. Success means accomplishments as the result of our own efforts and abilities. Proper preparation is the key to our success. Our acts can be no wiser than our thoughts. Our thinking can be no wiser than our understanding. This book of cures for lean purses has been termed a guide to financial understanding. That indeed is its purpose to offer those who are ambitious for financial success an insight which will aid them to acquire money, to keep money, and to make their surpluses earn more money. In the pages which follow, we are taken back to Babylon, the cradle in which was nurtured the basic principles of finance now recognized and used the world over. To new readers, the author is happy to extend the wish that its pages may contain for them the same inspiration for growing bank accounts, greater financial successes, and the solution of difficult personal financial problems so enthusiastically reported by readers from coast to coast. To the business executives who have distributed these tales in such generous quantities to friends, relatives, employees, and associates, the author takes this opportunity to express his gratitude. No endorsement could be higher than that of practical men who appreciate its teachings because they themselves have worked up to important successes by applying the very principles it advocates. Babylon became the wealthiest city of the ancient world because its citizens were the richest people of their time. They appreciated the value of money. They practiced sound financial principles in acquiring money, keeping money, and making their money earn more money. They provided for themselves what we all desire. Incomes for the future. GSC, began Kabai with an elaborate salute. Yet it does appear they have already been so generous thou needst not to labor. I rejoice with thee in thy good fortune. More I would even share it with thee. Pray from thy purse, which must be bulging, else thou wouldst be busy in yon shop. Extract but two humble shekels and lend them to me until after the nobleman's feast this night. 
thou wilt not miss them ere they are returned. If I did have two shekels, Bansir responded gloomily, to no one could I lend them, not even to you, my best of friends, for they would be my fortune, my entire fortune. No one lends his entire fortune, not even to his best friend. What? exclaimed Kabai with genuine surprise. Thou hast not one shekel in thy purse, yet sit like a statue upon a wall? Why not complete that chariot? How else canst thou provide for thy noble appetite? Tis not like thee, my friend. Where is thy endless energy? Doth something distress thee? Have the gods brought to thee troubles? A torment from the gods it must be, Bansir agreed. It began with a dream, a senseless dream, in which I thought I was a man of means. From my belt hung a handsome purse, heavy with coins. There were shekels which I cast with careless freedom to the beggars. There were pieces of silver with which I did buy finery for my wife and whatever I did desire for myself. There were pieces of gold which made me feel assured of the future and unafraid to spend the silver. A glorious feeling of contentment was within me. You would not have known me for thy hard-working friend, nor wouldst have known my wife, so free from wrinkles was her face and shining with happiness. She was again the smiling maiden of our early married days. A pleasant dream indeed, commented Kabai. But why should such pleasant feelings as it aroused turn thee into a glum statue upon the wall? Why, indeed? Because when I awoke and remembered how empty was my purse, a feeling of rebellion swept over me. Let us talk it over together, for, as the sailors do say, we ride in the same boat, we two. As youngsters, we went together to the priests to learn wisdom. As young men, we shared each other's pleasures. As grown men, we have always been close friends. We have been contented subjects of our kind. We have been satisfied to work long hours and spend our earnings freely. We have earned much coin in the years that have passed, yet to know the joys that come from wealth we must dream about them. Bah! Are we more than dumb sheep? We live in the richest city in all the world. The travelers do say none equals it in wealth. About us is much display of wealth, but of it we ourselves have not. After half a lifetime of hard labor, thou, my best of friends, hast an empty purse, and sayest to me, May I borrow such a trifle as two shekels until after the nobleman's feast this night? Then what do I reply? Do I say, Here is my purse, its contents will I gladly share? No, I admit that my purse is as empty as thine. What is the matter? Why cannot we acquire silver and gold, more than enough for food and robes? Consider also our sons, Bansir continued. Are they not following in the footsteps of their fathers? Need they and their families and their sons and their sons' families live all their lives in the midst of such treasures of gold and yet, like us, be content to banquet upon sour goat's milk and porridge? Never in all the years of our friendship didst thou talk like this before, Bansir. Kabai was puzzled. Never in all those years did I think like this before. From early dawn until darkness stopped me, I have labored to build the finest chariots any man could make, soft-heartedly hoping some day the gods would recognize my worthy deeds and bestow upon me great prosperity. This they have never done. At last I realize this they will never do. Therefore my heart is sad. I wish to be a man of means. 
I wish to own lands and cattle, to have fine robes and coins in my purse. I am willing to work for these things with all the strength in my back, with all the skill in my hands, with all the cunning in my mind. But I wish my labors to be fairly rewarded. What is the matter with us? Again, I ask you, why cannot we have our just share of the good things so plentiful for those who have the gold with which to buy them?